What's up everybody? Thank you once again for joining me in my review of the Final Fantasy Mainline series. And today is a very special day, as not only are we reviewing my favorite Final Fantasy of the franchise, we are reviewing my favorite game of all time. This game changed my life back when it came out. Now, originally released for on in Japan for the Super Famicom, known as Final Fantasy VI, when it was brought over the same year for the Super Nintendo. Of course, they had to do the renumbering, because at this point, this was the last entry where they actually changed the numbers. But following Final Fantasy II for Super Nintendo, naturally, they, even though they, that was four, they skipped five, and then six came out, and they had to rename it number three. Fortunately, after this one, <laughs> the numbers are the same, so I won't have to keep repeating that every game review. But... When this game came out for Super Nintendo, it just changed my world. Uh, four, of course, I played first, but six, or three as I knew it at the time, made me a gamer for the rest of my life. This, uh, this game made me aware of what games can be in terms of storytelling, character development, and just... Uh, so, something that will stick with you for the rest of your life. This game certainly did that. Now, what changed in this game from the previous ones was you typically had a party of... Uh, at Most of the times, it was at five at a time. And like through four, you had, very, you had characters come in and out of your party all the time. This game topped out at uh, 14 characters. You can see 12 of them here because two of them are actually secret characters. Although, technically... Mog there in the upper left is uh, optional. Uh, you have to kind of go a, d a different route to be able to get him. But the other two are a lot trickier to get, which we'll get into them. But as from what you see on the screen up top, we have 12 characters, each of them being represent a class from the previous games. Kind of like in 4, how each character had their specific abilities. This one went even further with really capturing all the different job class systems that part five had for your four party team, but making them as each of their own individual characters. Mog the Moogle, there on the top left, being a dancer. We have uh, Locke the Thief, or Treasure Hunter, as he preferred to be called, but he's a thief, he can steal things from him. Mog, sorry to go back, Mog being the dancer, I mean, he has a dance ability that he learns different dance steps depending on where he's fighting in a terrain, be it a, a cave, a river, the plains, a forest, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Next up is Celeste, the Magic Knight. Uh, she can use magic as well as absorb magic when she has a rune blade. So that's a great defense against like magic bosses or powerful enemies. Next up we have Terra. Uh, she is a half Esper, which uh, Espers in this game are the summons from the previous ones, but now they're given their own their own race, their own world. And uh, she can transform into an Esper form as well as use black magic. Then we have Sabin, the monk. He is a... Uh, yeah, uh, just as that. Black Belt Monk has kind of been changed over the years, but he is a martial artist who can use blitzes, which are special attacks that are inputted via, like, button commands, like in a fighting game. Like, you do the Hadouken motion, he'll throw his uh, aura wave. And other such moves like that you can do by entering different co combos, which, again, really changes how this game plays depending on your party makeup. At, after him is Cyan there in the top right. He is a samurai, although they refer to a knight who speaks in, in the English translation as very old-timey medieval thou, thus, nine. Uh, but he is a samurai, and he uses Bushido, uh, which is a charge bar, which goes up to different levels, and the higher you let it charge, the, uh, the stronger his attack will be. Then on the bottom left, we have Edgar, the king of Figaro, who is a machinist. He uses tools such as crossbow, uh, gassing people. He has a, a poison gas gun as well as the infamous Chainsaw, which has a chance of killing enemies in one hit, in which he dons a Jason mask, a Jason Warriors hockey mask, and can kill in one shot at random intervals. Next to him is Shadow the Ninja. He has the ability to uh, throw weapons, as well as have his, his uh, faithful dog Interceptor, who, Trudeau Zane, can intercept attacks and actually block for him, as well as Counter at times, where Interceptor will run out there and damage the enemy. Uh, following up in the trench coat is Setzer. He is an airship pilot as well as a gambler. He can roll dice and throw cards, and uh, his random his slots uh, special ability will give random effects. Uh, next up is Gao. He is um, basically the uh, a type of blue mage in a sense. 
Cause, uh, but not, not sure. It's pretty, he's a, he's a wild beast boy lived out in the plains by leaping into enemies. Uh, and then he'll leave your party. Then the next battle, he'll show up after you cut out the other enemies and he'll learn different techniques where, uh, of those enemies now, but yet, so it's kind of blue mage in a way, but it's also kind of berserker because most of them you'll lose control. He'll just keep attacking and doing what he does. So it's kind of unique in that way. Uh, next up is realm. She is a painter. Uh, she um, can basically copy an enemy right for a one shot, and they can they will attack back for him. Uh, again, kind of blue mage, and which is following the theme because finally there is Strago, her grandfather, realm's grandfather, who is a straight up blue mage. He if he can survive the attack of an enemy, he will have that spell at his use. Uh, from the from there we have uh, some of the well. Slides. I'm water, but we're going to keep rolling anyway. There are some more characters. We'll get into them once we get to the slides. But uh, the beauty of this game is how it's... Uh, you can make... After you hit a certain point in the game, you can completely make your party up however you want. With very few times where you'll have to have certain characters for the story purpose, it makes it to where there is no real main character in a sense. Uh, arguably... Uh, Tara, the green hair girl on the top, uh, starts off as the main character, main focal point with her being the Esper and escaping the Empire. Locke, very much seen as like the hero as he helps her out. But then there's even a point where Celeste, the magic knight, uh, the blonde lady up top, uh, kind of becomes a main character in another part of the in a later part of the game, which I'll get into because it's one of my favorite things that just really encompasses the game. But I, I believe it's the uniqueness of this game that has made it to where this game has been re-released from everything from Game Boy Advance to the Virtual Console PlayStation Network. Even a terrible looking uh, phone port. This is, uh, this, yeah, this is uh, what you're looking at here. While like, I don't mind like the portraits there, but I don't know, there's something about just the washed out sprites in here. But it is still 6, and if this is your way to play it, I would still recommend going to get it in that way. Here's, uh, of course, Yoshitaka Mano did illustrations, and, and here you can actually see some of the other uh, characters as well. Uh, in the uh, middle here, actually, we have uh, Umaro, who is one of the secret characters. He is a, uh, a, a yeti, a mountain yeti. So he's basically just, he can go berserk, so he's, he is also the berserker class. And he can, uh, well, he'll just start attacking and occasionally throw an ally at an enemy. Uh, the top middle there is Gogo, the mimic. Uh, at first, when you get him, uh, and again, these are secret characters. You gotta go through quite a little bit to to access them. It's not very uh, apparent. Gogo has the mimic ability to where uh, he will repeat uh, the action of the person. I believe it's on top in the uh, in the order, or is is that or is the last thing? The reason I don't really know is because. I didn't use him when I first beat the game because I didn't really like having like how it seemed almost random what he was doing. Then you find out you go to a status screen and you can actually select what abilities he has in his menu. So he can literally have blitzes, uh, no, the tools like Edgar, Steel, all kinds of stuff. So he's, he can really become an all-around character and it's pretty great. Uh, the main villain, at least, uh, he doesn't, not at first, but he's definitely one of the early antagonists, is Kefka. He is a, this is a chaotic magic user, working for the Empire, working under the Emperor. And he's really the first person that you see uh, as, like, a main antagonist. Of He's, like, the first face of the Empire you really see when you get to Figaro. And uh, he is crazy, I, and this wackiness, and the infamous... Uh, uh, Insult he uses in the original, uh, in the original translation, which has been retranslated by, I believe they kept it in for posterity, was calling someone a son of a submariner, which uh, maybe that's something I don't know. But Kafka has a, uh, a unique laugh in him that has uh, become synonymous with the character in in the Super Nintendo way of making him be able to laugh like that. But uh, what you're seeing here is two maps. On the left, you have the world of light and the world of ruin, and what. Why I'm showing that is specifically that Kefka is one of the few villains in the game, in video games, who wins. Halfway through the game, you go to take on the Emperor and Kefka, their big scheme of using the uh, the experts for them. And Kefka betrays the Emperor 
and takes power and then reshapes the world as he sees fit, wiping your entire party out like you guys are separated and sent and you don't know who's alive and who's dead. And without doing certain things, there's actually a character can be dead and never available in the game again. Kefka just eventually just goes on to just rule the world and becomes much like you see in the final battle with the this epic. I, everyone loves One Winged Angel, but Kefka's theme is just this angelic and evil and truly great battle and just that amazing sprite work. And this game just has some of the best sprite work. In the, of course, being at the end of Super Nintendo, it's not hard to say, but good lord, you just look at it. It's this beautiful game. And throughout, you meet the different characters of Resistance, like Bannon, and you, you know they'll come in and out, but you'll still have your main thing, your your main four. A uh, little bonus being that this is on uh, Bearded Kappa Productions, and I love my Kappa. I didn't even know this, of course, at the time because I wasn't aware. You can become an imp status in the game, and if you look at it, it's clearly it is a Kappa, and uh, I love it. I just had to make sure I pointed that out. And one of the most iconic moments in the game is the opera scene. It, it's a, uh, it's, it's a side, not a side mission, because it's part of the main uh, uh, storyline, but like in order to get uh, Setzer, they kind of have to go through and uh, uh, take part in the, uh, the opera to uh, trap him in, lure him in, so he can uh, kidnap some people, or kidnap Celeste, who's disguised as a girl. But what still comes from this is, uh, oops, <laughs> a little early. Uh, but what comes from that is is one of the uh, that you actually get to participate in the opera, learn your lines, and it's just a great musical score uh, that you can hear, that you actually see play out. And uh, so it's like I'm gonna try and get a little bit of uh, try to get a little bit of it going here for you so you can at least hear how it kind of, like some of the, this is Super Nintendo, and uh, here we go. And that represents uh, when she's speaking as best they could do for the Super Nintendo time. Yeah, I know that's antiquated music and sound chess, but fuck, that's beautiful to me still to this day. And it's a fantastic scene. And if you, I mean, just without context, it may not hold as much. You haven't played the game, but it's just amazing. And the soundtrack, of course, is just stunning throughout. And there's just so much epicness in the story of the different you deal with loss and rebellion and war, racism, uh, not knowing oneself. I mean, to the point where there's even a there's a moment when, uh, after Kefka wins and reshapes uh, the land, after going through, like, you know, like uh, Celeste especially, in the World of Ruin kind of takes uh, center stage to the point where she's, uh, like, alone. Like, after Kefka destroys the world, Celeste is more or less alone. She's with the Sid of the game, who was kind of a surrogate father for her. And, uh... Typically, because it's very hard, he's sick, and you have to get fish. And if you don't know what the right fish to get him, and nine times out of ten, this is this is uh, your pro most people I think would probably definitely the first time through are going to get to the will get the story point where he actually Sid dies, and Celeste is alone and thinks of t she's stuck on this lone island, uh, and then the only person she knew from her life is now dead, and to her, the best that she can figure, she thinks that. You no, know, everyone else is. She goes to depression and goes to a cliff, and jumps. So she, uh, yeah, she attempts suicide. She does survive, and then and you get a and you find out this uh, this bird actually has a bandana that looks like locks, and it kind of gives her the courage to go on that someone out there is still there. And that's, but I mean, like for a game that tackles suicide, especially in the Super Nintendo era, 
I can't think of another game top of my head that really dealt with this. And the way it was written, and you just feel for this character, it's just a tragic and just kind of beautiful moment of just like, and the way they did it, it's just, it stayed with me forever, you know. And of course, uh, to lighten it up a little bit, we have the infamous meme you've probably at least heard of, like, I'm a suplex a train. Because at one point when dealing with Cyan's storyline, who after he uh, lost his family uh, to Kefka poisoning their water, he lost his uh, son and wife to the poison, you end up in the ghost train seeing his family. And to get escape, you have to battle it. And if you use the Blitz Command Suplex, yes, you can suplex a train in Final Fantasy VI. Uh, but... This game is I could I could go on and on about just how wonderful this game really is. It's like I said, it it has its share of fans, I'm sure, and other people who will love other Final Fantasies more than this one, and that's perfectly fine. I know the next one we'll be talking about is, you know, part seven, and that one's a huge one for a lot of people and it's still held on. But for me, six is just the best Final Fantasy game. And for me, it's the best video game I've ever played. Now, And I, I try to play through it at least once a year. Admittedly, I don't always manage to get through all of it. But it's one that I just hold to the highest esteem. I would tell anybody to play it, even the horrible uh, cell phone version that you can get on like the Android or iOS store. Uh, it, yeah. I, again, I, I could gush all day and just get into intricacies of the story of war and, like, family and loss. Loss is a big part of this uh, storyline. And it's just one... I, I, I wish, I would hope, I'm hoping eventually that the Switch, which has all the PlayStation, the PlayStation 2 games, but they haven't done the Super Nintendo or Nintendo era. But out of all of them, I would love that they would put this one out. In a collection... In a not cell phone HD, but I'd be okay if they kind of upped it, updated the graphics a little bit for some people. But like this sprite work is just too beautiful to me. I don't think it needs to be changed. I would just love a port on the Switch, so maybe more people will be able to play it. But I think that's going to do it. This is definitely the longest video. Will probably be the longest video of this uh, series. But I appreciate y'all letting me just talk about my favorite game of all time, and. Uh, you know, I look forward to doing the rest of the Final Fantasy series. Is it all downhill from here? Nah, no, but this is definitely the peak in my opinion. But thank y'all once again. If you like this video, please uh, like, comment, subscribe, and share. Share away. And if you like this game, comment down. Tell me what you thought. You know, when did you first play it? Is it your favorite game or do you think it's overhyped? It's just nostalgia, but... I'd love to hear your thoughts on this game. Like I said, it, you, you know mine now well enough. But uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you all next time.